Hello and welcome to the Law of the Cards podcast, the podcast that uses Hearthstone as a vehicle to unpack the dense and sometimes complex lore of the Warcraft universe. More dragons as we dive into Dragon Saga, Chapter 3, Making a Monster. Galakron's reign of terror continues, and I hope you enjoy. Malagos would take it upon himself to try and find out what triggered Galakron's horrific transformation, an action many of his kind, with good reason, would have thought utterly insane. Malagos' actions would also make him seem even more unstable to his peers, as to find the answers he sought, he had travelled deep into the territory of Galakrond. Of course, Malagos was no fool and embarked upon this scouting mission when he had reason to believe Galakrond was not in the vicinity of his lair, though he knew the beast could return at any moment. It did not take too long for Malagos' search to bear fruit, noticing a discoloration in the ground below him. He discovered the bone of a large creature, and with some digging, discovered it was a proto-dragon. This was likely one of Galakron's earliest victims. The bones have been here for some time, around four or five seasons. Perhaps most importantly, this corpse demonstrated that Galakron's earlier victims did not rise up as one of the not living. Malagos inspected further. This corpse had not been swallowed whole, again suggesting it was an earlier kill. Galakrong had not grown to his current size when performing this kill, and the bone showed strain from where Galakrond had torn the flesh from the body. Malagos would return to his investigation, but before being able to gain more information, noticed a dark shape on the horizon, far too large to be that of a normal-sized proto-dragon. With cover too far away, Malagos' only hope was to flatten himself to the earth and hope Galakron did not see him, despite the fact Malagos' markings did not blend with the environment. The blue waited with bated breath as he heard the ominous beat of Galakron's wings. To Malagos' relief, the beat would begin to grow quieter, able to turn and watch Galakron head away from him toward the mountains. As Malagos finally dared to draw breath, Galakron halted. The giant began heaving and choking, but Malagos was far more concerned with how his appearance had changed rather than whatever malady was affecting the giant dragon. Galakron's form had distorted even further from the last time the blue had seen him. The growths that once gathered around just his gullet had now spread to his entire form, dotting his body. From his distance, Malagos was unable to determine whether these growths were the source of Galakron's madness. There were now darker segments to the dragon's skin. It looked as if parts of Galakron's body had begun to decay. Malagos' interest in how Galakron had changed was soon overtaken by a wave of utter disgust as shriveled proto-dragon corpses were unceremoniously expunged from Galakron's gut onto the ground below. The haggard, limp forms of dragons from multiple flights flopped pathetically to the ground. Further fear built up within Malagos, as there was no way of knowing if Naltharion, Ysera, and Alexstrasza were among the dead. They were also in the area. With one last almighty heave, the last of the dead spilled from Galakron's mouth, and as soon as he was done, he took to the air. Only when Galakrond had disappeared completely from view did Malagos begin to stir, but before rising back up fully, he saw three proto-dragons making their way to where Galakrond had once been. Three blue-green dragons, led by Koros. Noticing the mound of bodies, Koros and his followers alighted near them. After a short inspection, Koros looked in the direction of where Galakrond had headed, and to Malagos' surprise, led his followers in the same direction the gargantuan proto-drake had headed. Despite Malagos' extreme dislike for the blue-green, Koros was not stupid, certainly not suicidal. Why would Koros be following the dangerous Galakrond? If it was a further scouting mission for Talonyxia, he was going about it in a manner far more reckless than he needed. Perhaps Talonyxia was rubbing off on Koros a little. As Malagos considered following his bitter rival to warn him as he was not so petty as to allow Koros to fly into certain death, a ragged hiss erupted from the mound of proto-dragon corpses. 
At first, Malagos headed toward them, suspecting that maybe one of Galakron's victims had somehow survived. But as more hisses could be heard, a sinking feeling rose in the future aspect's gut. Several proto-dragons burrowed their way to the top of the corpse pile. When their eyes fixed upon Malagos, he saw no life behind them, the hollow eyes of the not-living. Malagos prepared to fly away, but before he could, one of the not-living rose just to his right, spewing malodorous gas in the Icy Blue's direction. From merely touching Malagos's wing, the gas filled the body part with a deathly agonising cold. Turning on this not-living, Malagos sprayed it with ice, giving him enough time to fight through the pain and fly upward. The sparse hisses below had now become a cacophony, and each not-living that rose would take to the skies to hunt their living counterparts. Not that Malagos saw this, he was focused on flying as high as he could into the clouds, the natural cover they gave being his best chance of survival. Within the murky cloud cover, Malagos did not stop, veering off sharply in a direction to try and lose as many of the not living as possible. The tactic was successful, many of the ragged hisses fading away as the undead chose the wrong direction to hunt the blue. This could not be said for all of them, however, and several hisses remained the same level, the not living tailing Malagos. The Icy Blue did anything to give him the best chance of survival, even keeping his jaw clamped shut and breathing through his nose to lessen the likelihood of the dead hearing him. Even with his superior intellect and tactics, this did not stop Malagos becoming the victim of misfortune. A pale red undead rose up through the clouds in front of the blue, colliding with him. Malagos struggled to hold off his new attacker, the potent smell of decay alone almost overwhelming him. The not living tore at Malagos' flesh while the blue dodge snaps from its grim mucus covered teeth. Lunging at the snapping teeth, Malagos sank his own into the lower jaw of the not living, and with an almighty heave, ripped off the dead's lower jaw, removing perhaps its most dangerous piece of weaponry. The not living's attack did not abate, even with the thick black ooze that used to be blood flowing from its jaw. Spitting out the rotting flesh, Malagos breathed in deeply and let loose a plume of freezing breath directly into the not living's exposed throat. The undead froze from within, causing it to relinquish its hold upon Malagos. Now free, the blue brought his tail crashing into the not living's now brittle torso, causing the body to break in half. As the defeated undead's body hurtled toward the earth, the hissing around Malagos intensified, clearly drawn to the commotion. Two more not living rose up before the blue, causing him to stop flapping and quickly drop below them. But Malagos had leapt from the frying pan and into the fire. Four of the not living greeting him below the cloud cover. All hopes seeming lost, the not living fell upon Malagos, holding the blue fast as he struggled for freedom. Though his vision was now mostly filled with the grim visages of the not living, Malagos was able to see what looked like a blast of sand smack into one of the undead with such force its back split in two, yet still it held on to Malagos. A booming roar broke out over the commotion of hisses, as Naltharion moved in to rescue his friend, tearing into the side of one of the clinging corpses. As one of the corpses broke away to deal with the grey, it was hit by another spray of sand, sending it reeling toward the earth. Bearing down on the undead, it had just struck a brown proto-drake, clamped its jaws around the neck of his victim. With such force, the undead's head was almost ripped clean off. With two drakes now torn from him, and one of them that still had hold of him in half, Malagos was now able to make a bid for freedom. Forcing the hind legs of the broken drake into the other undead, the legs instinctively gripped the wing of the other. Malagos doused this joining between the two not living with his frozen breath, making them unable to break from each other. Now laden with ice and awkwardly flapping to stay aloft, the two not living began to fall 
but dragging Malagos down with them. Malagos bit into the arm of the dragon that still held on, cracking a fang but eventually breaking the bone, which saw only the not living fall toward the rapidly approaching ground. Smashing into the earth, the dry corpses blew apart, body parts scattering. Now free, Malagos was able to look up at his saviours. It was not only the Brown and Neltharian that had come to his aid, but Ysera and Alexstrasza had also come, performing the highly necessary task of securing the area and making sure no further not living had joined the fray. Malagos joined with his allies, just as Neltharian had finished ripping his opponent to shreds. As the last scrap of flesh fell to the earth, the Grey proclaimed their victory. The Brown reminded the others there were more of the not living in the area. Malagos recognised him. He was a proto-dragon that had disapproved of Talonyxia, and the Blue had admired the Brown's technique just before Galakrond had arrived to disrupt their caribou hunt. The Brown was now able to introduce himself. He was Nosdormu. Nosdormu observed the area was thick with the not living and wondered why that may be. Doing his best, as while some proto-dragons were intelligent, they still spoke in broken sentences, Malagos explained the disgusting birth of the not living that he had been privy to. Despite how repugnant and incredible Malagos' tale sounded, the other four gathered knew that the blue story was one that they could trust. Alex Straza wondered how Galakrond had become the monster he now was, an answer which Malagos now felt he knew. Galakrond had always needed to eat large quantities, being so gigantic. Evidently, over time, there was not enough prey to feed Galakrond's seemingly unending hunger, and during a spell of starvation was when Galakrond turned on and feasted upon one of his own kind. Naltharion became angry. Galakron may have killed and eaten another, but why did he continue, even when a new source of readily available prey had migrated from the north? Even when the grazing caribou were plentiful, Galakron had still chosen to devour his own kind. Why do this? A question Malago sadly had no answer for. Hisses still in the distance were now growing louder, and the five compatriots decided they should leave the area rather than risk another confrontation with the not living. Perhaps the gathering proto-dragons had become impatient, bickering with one another. Perhaps her grip on command was beginning to loosen, or maybe she wanted to demonstrate the great leader she believed herself to be. Either way, Talonyxia, when the proto-dragons gathered again, would lead her kind in an assault against the not-living. The bronze female intentionally devised a plan to lure several of the undead. Her army, who outnumbered them greatly, would then strike. Nosdormu, clearly not trusting of Talonyxia's lead, had refused to be a part of this attack, but the other four future aspects, not quite sure where they stood yet, joined. Outnumbered the not living may have been, but the odds did not fill the unfeeling corpses with any degree of fear. They were still strong opponents, even with insurmountable odds. An overconfident red-orange female dove to attack a not living. Her target happily showed her the full devastating effect of the noxious clouds the not living could produce from their mouths. The thick smog covered the female's head and wings. Shaking it off, she prepared her own breath attack. Before anything left the female's mouth, her scales lost their brilliant fiery colour. The flesh beneath them, where the gas had touched, began to wither away, her skin peeling off in chunks. A mighty blast was not produced from the female's mouth, but a wailing death cry as her eyes glazed over, flesh peeled away, exposing her skull, and she dropped from the air. Angered by the Foolish Red's careless attack, Talonyxia flew down onto the undead responsible for the proto-dragon's death. Putting her frustration to good use, Talonyxia tore into the not-living spine and ripped the head clean off, a method she was aware would work thanks to information given to her by the future aspects and their experiences with the not-living. Booming to those that followed her, Talonyxia told them, 
That was the method they needed to use to destroy these abominations. The battle resumed, but despite their feeble looking forms, the undead made up for this with tenacity, still able to kill several more of the living before being overwhelmed. Now, Tharion was perhaps the only dragon that relished these encounters, as they allowed him to bask in the glory of combat, the Grey ably showing off his fearlessness and strength. Malagos, Alexstrasza, and Ysera could not share their friend's enthusiasm. They still saw the living in the faces of the undead. They destroyed these twisted mockeries of life through necessity, getting no joy from the battle itself. The final blow of this skirmish was struck by Talonyxia herself, a bolt of lightning shooting from her open mouth and setting the final not living's flesh ablaze, a second bolt reducing the flaming corpse to ash. Talonyxia roared in triumph, which in turn provoked the other proto-dragons to roar their victory. This caused Malagos to look upon his allies with disbelief. How could they not see that this commotion could put them in further danger? More of the not living may be zoning in on their cries. The Blue made sure to keep his thoughts to himself, as Talonyxia was not welcoming of dissent within the ranks. She had scarred the face of a copper male for questioning her, and she had several overzealous followers that had been known to do worse if their great leader was undermined in any way. Malagos would keep his dissent private in discussions with his close friends. Perhaps they would form a better plan with how to deal with Galakrond and his undead hordes. As of yet, though, no plan had come. Malagos caught sight of a descending Ysera and followed. The small yellow dragon was searching among the undead. She was breathing heavily, combat taking its toll on the weaker dragon more than most. The yellow announced to Malagos that what she was searching for was not here. She could see no sign of any of these undead being her dead clutch brother, Dralad. Malagos told her he was dead but Ysera rebuttaled that her brother's body had not been torn apart and no longer lay where it had been found. This could have been for a number of reasons. Ysera's reasoning was not enough to convince Malagos her brother was now a not living. The Icy Blue believed that at this time, Galakrond had not gained the disturbing ability to raise the dead. Dralad's body had been laying in the same place for some time before Alexstrasza and Malagos found him. There had also been others killed around the time Dralad was murdered, and none had risen as undead. Malagos did not bother pushing this, assuming Ysera's sister had argued this with her for some time. This didn't stop Malagos from worrying. What if those that had been dead longer were now rising too? The threat to their kind would be even worse than initially thought. With Ysera gone, Malagos heard a low hiss in the canyon. He decided to try and locate it. Perhaps one of the not living was not quite dead. He did not hear the hiss again, but Malagos searched on with determination, entering an area almost black with shadow. After his eyes adjusted, Malagos caught sight of a small flowing figure, but before he could determine what it was, his head began to pound, the intensity of which causing Malagos to black out. When he awoke, the figure was no longer there. After the brutal encounter with the not living, Ysera's distaste for combat grew with every fight the proto-dragons took part in, at the end of each struggle trying to search for her brother. Eventually, she would become completely disillusioned with the proto-dragon's direction. She began to preach to the others her theory and hopes for peace with the ravenous Galakrond. Others clearly felt similarly to Ysera, as over time, she would amass a small following. Her sister Alexstrasza became worried, and sought to find her sister to reason with her. She didn't for three days. She sought out Malagos, seeking advice from perhaps the wisest among the proto-dragons and confided in him. The Blue was also concerned by what trouble Ysera may get herself into if she tried to actively seek peace with Galakrond. He believed Ysera's sister finding and speaking to her was essential. Assured by Malagos, Alexstrasza resumed her hunt for her sister, while Malagos began to hunt to sate his hunger. The Icy Blue's hunt was a successful one, able to capture several prey from the ocean. 
As he feasted upon a well-caught meal, Malago saw several proto-dragons in the distance. Taking to the sky, Malagos flew toward the dragons, recognising one as Ysera. Another of the five dragons, Malagos did not expect to be Ysera's companion, Koros. The Green Blue's aspirations for a peaceful relationship with Galakrond did not match Ysera's. He believed proto-dragons should live under the giant's rule. A rather sudden change of heart, since not too long ago, Koros seemed fanatically loyal to Talonixia. Evidently, Galakron's power was more alluring to him than that of Talonixia's. Either way, Malago saw Ysera's bid for peace as naivety. The untrustworthy Koros no doubt had far more insidious plans. Malagos was more often than not happy to watch events play out from a distance, but now he felt a loyalty to the others that would become aspects, far more than even his own flight. The five had always been truthful and stood by one another. Malagos told Ysera that Alex Straza was seeking her, but the yellow did not seem to care. Alex Straza could fly on for all she cared. Harsh words that took Malagos a little aback. The sisters may squabble from time to time, but they had always been extremely close. Malagos began to try reasoning with Ysera, saying Galakrond would not listen to them. But Ysera sharply interjected that the Leviathan would, and an agreement of peace would be reached. Malagos tried to continue, saying it was unlikely Galakrond would listen, and to his surprise, Ysera corrected him. They had already spoken with Galakrond, and he said that he was willing to talk peace. Koros interjected the Grand Proto-Dragon would talk peace if all would listen. Ysera told Malagos they were searching out Talonixia to tell her and all the gathering Proto-Dragons that peace was what they needed to seek with Galakrond, not war. As Ysera and those accompanying her headed off, Malagos immediately turned to seek out Alex Straza. For while wanting Ysera's dream to become a reality, Malagos feared all it could achieve was more death. For hours, Malagos frantically searched for Alex Straza, knowing that each hour that passed, Ysera and Koros may have reached Talonixia. They may convince the headstrong female, but no matter what the result, Malagos felt it could not end well. Eventually, he found the Fire Orange Proto-Dragon, immediately telling her that he had seen Ysera, and she was with Koros. News that Alex Straza reacted to in a similar way as to when Malagos first saw the two together, with a measure of disbelief. Malagos quickly told her of Ysera's intention, and Alex Straza immediately took flight, wanting to save her sister from an action she felt may later end in her death. Malagos calmed Alex Straza, Ysera would not die. Koros was a liar. They would need to expose the truth of what Koros was up to, and when they did, no doubt Ysera would come to her senses. A plan of attack, Alex Straza thought wise. Before they could fly after Ysera though, a familiar roar boomed. Malagos and Alex Straza dived looking for a shadowy place to hide. They had barely been able to hide away when Galakron's vast shadow blackened the area, seeking out more victims to feed the endless hunger that tore at him. As Galakron passed over, Malagos dared to snatch a glance at the underside of the behemoth. More and more growths had started to form on the dragon, with some now taking shape. They looked like barely developed body parts. Forming forearms, legs and even wings protruded from the massive form, pathetically flapping in the wind as Galakron pushed forward. The most alarming body part forming on Galakrond was what looked like an undeveloped head, thrusting from the dragon's hip. Malagos was transfixed by Galakrond's misshapen form. Luckily, the giant did not turn to see Malagos staring at him, and continued on, disappearing over the horizon. With Galakrond gone, Alex Straza and Malagos flew as fast as they could to catch up to Ysera. The place where Talonixia had previously called Proto-Dragon Gatherings was still undiscovered by the marauding Galakrond. Since this was likely Ysera and Koros' final destination, Malagos and Alex Straza headed there. 
When they arrived, Talonyxia was giving one of her rallies. More of us here. So many more. Galacron cannot fight all. Cannot. They had arrived partway through her speech and scanned over the throng of proto-dragons hissing their approval at Talonyxia's words, searching for Ysera. Alexstrasza saw her sister, not far from Talonyxia's rocky perch from which she spoke, Koros nearby. Oddly, Koros's followers appeared to be waiting a fair amount back from Ysera and their leader. Why were they not standing with them? It was odd of them to distance themselves from their leader. As Talonyxia basked in the glory of the approval of her followers, Koros sidled up to her and whispered in her ear. Her eyes fixed upon Ysera, Koros almost immediately slinking away into the background. Malagos and Alexstrasza landed, watching on with trepidation as the scene before them unfolded. This runt speaks, announced Talonyxia, indicating to Ysera that she could address the gathering. Ysera looked to Koros for support before addressing the crowd, the blue-green merely giving a nod in her direction. Alexstrasza angrily observed that Koros was leaving Ysera to pitch her notion of peace alone. Action Malagos was not surprised by. Koros would deflect focus away from himself, and if Ysera's idea was accepted by the majority, he would be right beside her, soaking up the glory. The small, weak yellow pulled herself up to her full height before addressing the crowd. While Ysera was among the smallest proto-dragons, something about her determination and will often made her seem far more imposing than she was in reality. Ysera began her speech in a similar way to how Talonyxia conducted herself. We are many, the yellow shouted, approving murmurs rising from the gathered masses. But she had a caveat. They may be many, but Galacrond was Galacrond, massive, strong, and powerful. Against such a monstrous adversary, the gathering proto-dragon army would be killed, a point that received far less approval from the other proto-dragons. Talonyxia hissed angrily. The runt was undermining her. Knowing what the dominant female was capable of, other proto-dragons shifted uneasily, but Ysera was not put off. She continued. Ysera told the crowd that this did not have to be their fate. They could all be saved if they would just talk with Galacrond. She reasoned Galacrond had once been one of them. He had spoken with them before, hunted with them before, and the mighty worm would talk peace if only they would listen. Ysera's speech was cut off by harsh laughter. Talonyxia thought her idea foolish. Galacron may have hunted with them before, but now those that had once been his companions were now his prey. He would never talk peace. Ysera tried to argue Talonyxia's point, but she was drowned out not only by Talonyxia's laughter, but the laughter of the rest of those gathered. Distressed by the mockery her sister now received, Alexstrasza started forward to defend her, but was cut off by Malagos. He knew Ysera would not like Alexstrasza stepping in and making her look weak. Grudgingly, Alexstrasza listened to her friend. Fire Orange Drake could only mournfully look on as Ysera looked upset and confused as to why her speech had fallen on deaf ears. Malagos became aware of something. Where was Koros? Clearly Koros and his three followers had vanished when they realised Ysera's speech was not going well. Looking over the crowd, Malagos caught a glimpse of one of Koros's followers disappearing over a distant rock. Before Malagos could decide what to do with this information, Talonyxia once again seized control of the gathering. She dismissively mocked Ysera. There would be no peace for the ones that hunted them. Now they would hunt Galacrond. A statement greeted by roars of approval. Alexstrasza pleadingly looked to Malagos. Now was the right time. Focus was off Ysera and her sister could comfort her without showing her up. 
Having listened to Malagos' sound advice, Alex Straza rushed to consult her sister. Malagos attempted to find either Naltharian or Nosdormu in the crowd as Talonyxia resumed speaking. She said the proto-dragons would win a fight with Galakrond. Clearly egged on by her words, one proto-dragon cried they should attack him now. Talonyxia immediately shut this notion down. She would be the one to decide when the attack began. More still needed to come, but she did set a time. Three suns pass, and we attack. Galakrond will fall. Malagos paused when hearing this. He didn't like it. It was too soon. Things were moving too fast. He seemed to almost be alone in that opinion, though, as the rest of the crowd erupted with approval. As they cheered, Malagos caught sight of Koros, the blue-green's head rising above and outcropping to the north, almost immediately sinking out of view, unaware Malagos had spotted him. Finding his friends would have to wait. Malagos knew that his rival was up to something sinister. Remaining on the ground, Malagos headed in the direction he had spotted Koros, leaving Talonyxia's continued blustering behind him. Malagos had chosen the right time to pursue, as he was able to catch Koros and his followers flying away at an urgent pace, keeping low to the ground so that no one would see them leave. Malagos wished he could have found one of his friends to accompany him, but with no time, and suspecting Koros could only be up to no good, he tailed the blue-green mob. And we'll find out what Koros was up to on the next Dragon Saga, Chapter 4, Koros's Gambit. Thank you so much for listening, I really hope you enjoyed. As always, I'd really appreciate any support. If on YouTube, do the subscribe, the like, you know, that stuff. On Spotify, give this podcast a follow, and on iTunes, give us a review. Special thanks this episode goes out to Derpa Livioski, hopefully I said that right, for his review of the podcast. To anybody that enjoys Warcraft lore and fantastic narration, this is the podcast for you. The series started on YouTube with a six-year backlog of excellent content across the breadth of the Warcraft franchise. James Moffat, the podcast creator, puts extra care into delving into the details. At times, his high-quality work has even been officially published via Blizzard themselves. I've followed his work for years and would highly recommend taking the time to listen to this podcast. You are too kind. No, really, you're really too kind. Thank you so much for the review. Until next time, everyone, thank you so much for listening, and goodbye.